Hey guys, welcome to the latest episode of the 4040 Vision podcast, the ultimate sports history pod where hindsight is 4040. Before we get started, let's pay some bills and hear from our presenting sponsors. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 13 of the 4040 Vision podcast, the ultimate sports history pod brought to you by Sideline Sports. I'm your host, Khaled Abdallah, and with me today is my fellow host, Osama Dahoud, and a special guest, Mujtaba El Gouda from the Golden State Warriors. Uh, Mujtaba is a manager of team development with the Dubs, and fresh off winning the 2022 NBA championship, he sat down with Osama and I to talk about how he got his start with the team, what it's like working with stars like Steph Curry and young guys like Jordan Poole, his role in helping rookies get acclimated to the NBA, what his day-to-day is like you know, as a manager of team development, and much, much more. Uh, this is a great episode, probably my favorite so far of the 4040 Vision Pod. Uh, so let's jump right in. So uh, first of all, uh, Mustafa, thank you for, for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time out to, to meet with a couple hardcore Warriors fans here. Uh, so, yeah, I, I guess I should have started with a big congratulations on uh, on winning a ring this year. How do you feel? Uh, first of all, thank you guys for having me and, and thanks for the congrats. It's crazy because it, it hasn't fully hit me yet um, because we, we flew back from Boston the Friday after the championship and then Saturday at 8 a.m. we had a draft workout and then obviously we were doing all the draft stuff. <laughs> So, I never stopped, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was. And, and then when we had the parade, that's when it, it hit a little bit. Um, and I think after summer league, we, that's when our offseason starts. We get a little bit of time off. And I think that's when it'll fully hit me because I'll be able to go home, see my parents. I plan on going to Sudan to see my family this summer. Um, and I think just being around all of that and, and stepping away from work and, and being able to refresh and be like, okay, man, I see what it took to, to play into June. Um, and I think that's when it'll fully hit me. But right now, it's still like, you know, we're, we're getting ready for summer league. So it's kind of still like, man, you know what? We're still working. So for sure, for sure. So I, I saw that on, I did a little creeping on your LinkedIn, I will admit. <laughs> uh, I saw you join the Warriors in October 2018. So this is your your first real playoff run, right? First ring and all that with the team. Yeah. Uh, so and, and especially, too, because that first year when I joined, I was on the business operations side. Um, so obviously it, it entailed, uh, much different duties than what my current job does. So I wasn't really as, as close to the basketball side of it. So I didn't get to see the ins and outs that I, I do now. And so, um, and then obviously you guys know the two years after that, we weren't really good. So we, we came yep. nowhere, nowhere near to, to what we touched this year. So this, this one has definitely been a new experience and I think I've been able to appreciate it. Cool. And I, I think that that's a good segue, I think, to, to something I really want to talk about was how did you get your start with the Warriors? As you said, you're on the business side and now you're on the basketball side. You know, how did that? Well, first of all, how did you end up you know, joining the Warriors? I think you're you're from the Nanova area, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I've lived uh, lived in D.C., Maryland, and now my parents live in Northern Virginia. So I've lived in all three regions of the, of the DMV. Um, and so I went to I went to school in in the seven five seven the Virginia Beach Hampton Roads area. I went to school in Newport News, um, and so I uh, played basketball there for a year before I got hurt. And then when I you know I was business administration was going to do consulting. That's like the big industry in 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 the Nova DC area. And I was working in consulting. And as I was doing that, one of my boys from from college he was working for the Washington football team like a ticket sale. That was my first time. I, I thought to work in sports, you had to be a former pro athlete or the son or daughter of one. So that's when I was like, okay, you know what, let me explore it. And so I actually started my master's degree in sports management at Liberty, but I was doing it online. So I started the chance to work. And then I, I at the same time, I was doing it like a game day internship with the Washington football team where I, I managed the 50-50 raffle program. So it was, it was good because I only have to work on game days. Um, and that was kind of my first segue into sports. And um, that helped lead me into the Warriors position because the first position I have with the Warriors is development coordinator. I, uh, I was in charge of fundraising for the foundation. One of the programs I ever saw was the 50-50 raffle ticket program. 
And my boss with the Washington football team was a development coordinator. So it just, I had a lot of kind of insight into what that, that you know, program uh, or that position entailed. Um, and so that's kind of how, like a play by play of how I actually got into the Warriors position. I applied, I was with the Washington football team for like two months. So I didn't even do it a full year, but I came across the position did like 10 interviews with them because I know in their mind, they were like, man, this kid is across the country, like <laughs> yeah. worth it. And, uh, and I finally ended up moving out uh, like right at the beginning of that last 2018, 2019 season. Okay. And how did you make that transition? I mean, how did you go from the business side to the basketball side? Was it your background playing in college? Like you said, like what, what helped you make that transition? That's the question I always get asked. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a curious one, right? Yeah, it doesn't happen a lot too. And so what happened, man, was it's crazy because I I think I was my that first year, I was just happy to one, you know, be living in California. That was always something I wanted to do. Um, to be working in sports, to be working for an organization like the Warriors. I grew up a Lakers fan, but I supported the Warriors just because as someone that played basketball, walk up watching basketball, like they just play a beautiful style of ball. Yeah. And so for me, man, I was taking that in. Um, and so I never had this like goal of like let me get into basketball operations so what happened that first year was this is when we were in oakland the the overall warriors organization was much smaller than it is now now we have 500 full-time employees because wow. we run our own building so security everyone is, is warriors employee back then we rented oracle from aeg so the only mm -hmm. full-time employees were the ones that worked in the, in the front office on the business and basketball side and um so there's only a hundred of us. So when I started, I remember my first game, I'm in the public affairs suite and I meet uh, David Kelly, the chief legal officer for the Warriors, uh, Muslim. I didn't know he was Muslim at the time. He just comes yeah. up to me, oh. I know. have some mutual friends with him, curiously enough, but I, I've never met great him. Great guy, no, nah, great guy. That's like a big brother, my mentor. I would not be where I'm at without him. And so he comes up to me, he's like, oh man, I, you know, I know pretty much all the black employees here. I've never seen you. And I was like, yeah, I just started. He's like, man, let's get, let's get lunch. Um, and so we got lost like a couple of weeks later, he and I both diehard soccer fans. So we would just, we would get lunch pretty much every two to three weeks. And then around Ramadan, he found that I was Muslim. He would invite me over to Iftar. He hosted like an Iftar at the old practice facility. And we just became super close just off of soccer. One, one day, like right after that season ended when we lost to Toronto, we're at one of our regular lunches. It's the first time we ever talked about work. He asked me what I wanted to do long-term. And I was like, man, you know what? I've just kind of been step like this first year i kind of analyzed the, the situation with the organization i realized that um you know this is where i feel like i could help in terms of you know uh helping the young guys develop you know I, I i grew up playing basketball and so i have a basketball mind and then my roommate at the time we had just moved in he's actually still my roommate now is david fatoki who's the gm of our, our g league team so one of oh, my wow. best friends okay. nigerian so he and i had gotten close so he would bring me around the other members yeah, the of the African box. connection there. Yeah. And so I would always <laughs> be around. And so literally the next morning I'm pulling into the facility, David pulls in at the same time, David Kelly, and he goes, send me your resume, you know, with Andre Guadalla getting traded and Sean Lipson retiring. Bob Myers and I were actually talking about a position to help players kind of acclimate, young players acclimate into the NBA lifestyle. And so sent him my resume, interviewed with him, our VP of HR, Coach Kerr and Bob Myers. And they decided to, to, to trust me with the position. I think what helped too is like, I knew Quinn Cook and Damian Lee because I played AU with them growing up in the DC area. I was kind of relationship with them. So that first year when I was on the community side, they would ask me to come out to community events that they had. And I knew KD because I went to a couple of his camps. And I was, I was like a 23 year old black kid that didn't come from money. So I could relate to the players. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that was the official like kind of parlay into, into the basketball side. Uh, it seems like it was destiny almost, right? The I like the to right think people. I like to think it wasn't yeah. that they made a mistake by by putting <laughs> faith in a young a young uh, a young nobody. So I like to think it was destiny. I mean, it seems to have paid off. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so far it has. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Was it everything you expected? Like you you got into basketball operations and you pivoted from business to sports management because it was your passion. Was, was it what you expected? And then I have a couple of follow-up questions when you finally like got to the Warriors. I'd say more, man. Like I, I, to me, it's cause I've only been with the Warriors, but like, man, the way, like the, we, I know culture is the one thing that's always get thrown out in the media in terms of the Warriors, but like, it really is like, it's, it, I've, I've never felt out of place here, man. Like I, 
the just the, the the whole culture has been great and I think that's helped because I know with some other teams like it might not be the same setup um and so I, I'd say it's been more than everything I expected like I love what I do you guys can't see it right now but it's a beautiful day out so I like wake up to this beautiful view and like um you know ever like and uh, the one thing I will say too is like um and and how did you probably notice because you say you stalked my LinkedIn I, I did I, I did I've been here almost <laughs> four years and I've gotten a, I've been able to get blessed to get a promotion every year and I think a lot of that entails to like Bob one thing I respect about Bob Myers is that he uh he trusts his young staff for so much and allows us to grow and to me I think that's been the part that I didn't expect what was the culture like during that couple of years where it it, it was uh, almost like rebuilding a, a, a wounded beast, right? Like you, there was the COVID year, which was kind of weird and, and, and the team was in the lottery. We have a lot of startup companies here in Silicon Valley. And you mentioned the staff was pretty small too at the time compared to now. How did you think that worked for your development from for to see it grow 5X and then see as someone new to development, well, that must have been really interesting in your own development, right? To work with a team that um, was kind of struggling, not not up to the gold standard that they usually are. What was that like? Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, that year when we won 15 games was, besides this year, probably arguably my most favorite. Um, and, and I think there was, at the end of that year, I think, and Coach Kerr is like, uh, you know, end, end of the season press conference, he said that was the year he probably enjoyed coaching the most. And it was Yeah, I remember him saying that, yeah. Yeah, like we, I, I think everyone top down, top to bottom in the organization was allowed to fail. Um, and it was just like, I'm, the one game I'll never, there's two games I'll never forget. It was uh, the Christmas Day game where Damian Lee went off and we beat the Rockets when they had James Harden and Russell Westbrook. Like, that was super dope. Yeah. And then when Eric Pascal went for 34 on his birthday and we beat the Blazers. Um, and it was, that was just moments where it was like, man, you know, everyone expected us to lose every game. So it was just fun. And it was, you could see the growth of those guys. So I would say, and I think what helped us too is like, if, if we knew with, you know, Steph and Clay and Draymond was hurt for a big portion of that year too. So we knew it's like, this isn't who we really are as a team. This is just kind of a temporary, I think if, if we were just a bad team, then they would have been like, all right, man. But I think the fact that we knew like, this is just temporary and it's allowing our guys to grow was, was, was such an amazing feeling. There's some like some hope at the end of the tunnel, light at the end of the Absolutely. tunnel for sure. for sure. Absolutely. What's your what are you most proud of at this point in your career so far? Uh that actually changed a week, uh yeah, a week and a half ago. It used to just be like, man, like that's totally think, fair. <laughs> yeah, the, the biggest thing it used to be like my dad, like my dad used to watch basketball occasionally, like he was a huge LeBron James fan because he in Dirk Nowitzki because he really started watching basketball that year when, you know, Dallas and Miami, when Dallas beat Miami in, in the finals. Um, and so, you know, he'd watch every now and then. So when I got the job at first, he didn't really know what I was going to be doing. He just was like, okay, you know, you, this is something you want to do. My mom was the same thing. She was like, oh, you're going all the way to California. But like, but I think up until a week and a half ago, it was like, oh man, just seeing them, like my dad would like some of your games or like I travel a lot for work. So like being able to bring them out with me on certain trips or like, you know, they've gotten a chance to meet players or stuff like that. So like for them, like seeing and like they'll always, they'll have like there's a bunch of like Muslim kids that live in my neighborhood and all the kids will, will run to their parents and be like, I want to do it when they're with us. And like they'll come and th those parents will tell my mom and dad. And so them always calling me about stories like that was super cool. Uh, but I say that changed a week and a half ago because like right after we won a championship, I don't know if you guys know Amin Al-Hassan. Um, yeah, 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 of course. So he's like a mentor of mine. Um, he's okay. like a big brother to me because he was the first uh, Sudanese person to be in the vast operations in NBA history. And then I was second. I didn't notice that he told me, but he came up to me with our like ex a senior vice president of PR right after he won the championship. I don't know how he got into our locker room, but I mean, did somehow. The big shot. And, yeah. <laughs> so they both came up to me and they're like, man, you know, I don't know if you know, but like, uh, you know, you're the first Sudanese player, executive or coach of winning NBA championship. And I was like, I didn't process it then because I was still trying to process that the season was done. Not even I won the championship, but it was like, oh, no more travel. Like the season is done because it had been such a long year. And I think once that hit me and like all my aunts, uncles and everyone, because I guess it, it like a bunch of different like Sudanese publications posted it and they all started hitting me on WhatsApp. And that's when I was like, oh, this is dope. Like this is, you know, like it's 
that's such an amazing thing and so I, I will say that's probably like the most thing that the thing that I'm most proud about so far in my career that's awesome that's amazing um when when you look at now you you work with players um haven't been a player yourself what are like tendencies you had as a player that's kind of fun in developing players that maybe is unique to you and maybe maybe you enjoy the most or, or the least when you're I'm sure you're looking at numbers and developing plans like what 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 jumps out to you yeah I would say I I admit that I was lazy when I was a player because I, I think I never really saw I, I knew I couldn't make it to the NBA um and for me I just I like playing the game because it was fun uh but like so one thing the first thing that always stands out to me is just like I remember my first year on the basketball operation side was Jordan Poole's rookie year and from the jump Jordan's work ethic was crazy so that was the first thing that stood out to me was like man you respect the game so right off jump I respect that um but the one thing I always try to tell guys is like man uh especially like these past two years with like 19 year olds um it's just like uh, like y'all are human so uh, like understand that we're going like there's gonna be moments where you fail like one thing I always stress to our guys is that if you're going into a game or a season trying to be perfect you've already failed the our mindset when we go into a game is we're trying to make more positive plays than we do negative plays we're trying to make more winning plays than we do games that you know derail the team um, and that's always the biggest thing because now social media is so big and it, and it affects these guys and like I would say that's one piece of it and then like the other piece of it too is like I said, these guys are humans first before basketball players. So I try to prioritize their development as human beings as much as I do basketball players. So like last night I took um, our rookie Patrick Baldwin Jr. to dinner. Tomorrow I'm gonna take the rookies and Moses Moody to a, a, a Giants baseball game, like things like that, where it's just like, man, don't think you're a robot. Like you don't have to do basketball 24 seven, you're gonna fall out of love with it. And so I would say things like that. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like, so from my, limited understanding of, of what I, I thought it was that you do. I thought it was almost strictly basketball, but it sounds like you're on the development side from the basketball and, you know, developing these, these, especially the young guys as a person. Um, and that was actually one of my questions is how, you know, how early do you get involved with these rookies? And it sounds like, you know, almost the day after the draft, you're already taking these guys out to dinner and, you know, showing them around and stuff. Yeah, I would, I would, it's, it's immediate. I would say day one, um, so what we'll do is in such an itineraries, pick up the guys from the airport, bring them, they'll do their press conference. So that's what they're doing all day Friday. Um, and then right then and there, we, you know, our Jamma, who's our director of player development on the coaching side, work with him to, to get the guys in the gym to shoot and plan out the development schedules. Um, Cause you don't want them to just sit around kind of the hotel going anxious. But my biggest thing is trying to immediately show them the city that they're going to be living in um, and trying to connect them with, with you know, with staff and, and just having those introductory conversations before the year kicks off where everything, you know, kind of becomes, really gets going. So it's interesting because the Warriors have been, have doubled down on working with young guys, which has been kind of different than some other contenders. What's the, is there a balance? Well, like, what is your balance when you work with being lucky enough to, or fortunate to work with all these young guys. And then you also have a very veteran squad too. What's that balance like? Uh, I mean, I think it's, I think it's great. I personally, I think, yeah, I remember when last year when we got our guys, we, we kind of got a fair amount of criticism for that. Um, but to me, I, I think it, it works out well because having those young guys around benefits our young guys, obviously, but also I think benefits our veterans. Um, I think for them, they kind of, it, it reignites their fire for the game. Um, but also like, I mean, you, you guys obviously know basketball, watch basketball. Like when you see the things Jonathan Kuminga can do on the court, it, it excites, you know, our veterans and, and, you know, it helps them understand that it can ease the game for them as well. Some of the physical things that those guys can do, like you look at Wiseman, he's 7-1 speed that he has and like, and it allows our guys to get some rest days. But I also just think from a, a human standpoint too, like we have a really good group of guys. So those guys, you know, love serving as the vets. And so I think, man, I think, I, again, I, I tell it, it, it kind of ties back into culture and specifically, you know, our four core guys and Andre, Steph, Draymond and Clay, like 
you can go to a, a lot of teams where the vets would say, mm, I'm not really trying to <laughs> develop young guys. And so it, there's really no other way to explain it other than that those guys have a lot of to foster an environment like that. So for these young guys, I mean, I'm, I'm sure obviously off the court, it's a huge transition to the NBA, but on the court, they're going from being, you know, the stars of their teams, the, the big fish in the little pond. And then they're coming to a team where, you know, if you're Jonathan Kaminga or Moses Moody, maybe you're not playing for a couple games or you're playing some spot minutes here and there. How do you help them deal with that transition and helping them, you know, understand their roles on a team like this? Yeah, I think number one, it's, it's being honest. Actually, that I had that conversation last night with, uh, with Baldwin because I was like, man, I stepped back and I was like, just on our roster alone, he's the third player that was number one in this class alongside Wiseman and Kaminga. And so, wow. We have three guys like that on our roster now. Um, so I would just say being honest with them, like understanding, you know, the expectation, understanding the difference between where you're at now as a 19 year old in comparison to where you're going to be when you hit the prime of your career. But I also think certain things like winning championships help. So it's like, you know, yes, you might have won at the lower level, but, you know, a guy like Kaminga, Kaminga could have been playing 30 minutes on another team. But for him to say, you know, he contributed to an NBA championship at such a young age, not many guys can say that. And so I think, you know, we've been fortunate to have that because that helps a lot, but I would just say being honest with these guys and helping them understand that everyone in the organization is here to help them develop into the player that we know that they they can and will become. Yeah, and I'm sure it's, it's easier, like you said, to, uh, you know, play limited minutes on a championship team versus 30 minutes on a team that goes, you know, yeah. 20 and 60 or, or whatever it is. So. Absolutely. Uh, winning, winning cures all, right? <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> yeah. So aside from, from working with, uh, you know, these young guys, I mean, is there a specific role that you take on with, with some of the veteran players, you know, with the Iguodala's, the, the Steph Curry's, like, what, what do you, how do you help them in their continued development? Yeah. So it's, it's so much easier with those guys because they, they know how to play. Um, so in terms of their development, I, I also I work closely with Sean Livingston in terms of like, off-court opportunities for the guys. So, man, Iguodala has been great in terms of like, you know, we have a bunch of guys that, that want to get into tech investing. So Sean and I will set up opportunities like that, um, you know, rehab plans, working with the coaching and, and training staff. Like when Steph got hurt, working on his rehab plan, certain things like that. And then just other, other front office things. So I do, I'm a college pro and I do international scouting as well. Um, and then uh, service assistant GM for our GD team. So helping out for Topi, whatever he may need in that regard. Um, and then player personnel. So obviously this week is, is free agency. So, you know, that's a busy week for us, but they, uh, yeah, they, they throw me around, but I enjoy it. Uh, speaking of, of international scouting, have, have you seen the movie Hustle that came out recently? I have. Sure. It's, it, it's very realistic. It's a great movie. <laughs> you read my mind. That was my question. Is you know, Because I've it, gotten that question like five times. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Everyone has texted me like, man, now I kind of get, because I went, um, I made three international scout trips this year and all my friends are like, man, are you really working over there? And I'm like, trust me, I am. Like I'm in these beautiful countries, but I'm actually working. And so they are like a like, sweaty oh, basketball man. gym. It's, yeah, it's, on it's, vacation. Not, it's not like the NBA gyms here and like you have to get around and like it's yeah and so everyone's always like now everyone's texting like oh okay I, I kind of get an idea of what you do <laughs> yeah it doesn't seem uh, as glamorous when <laughs> yeah. you see the behind the scenes of it yeah exactly uh, yeah so I mean it's, aside from from all that I mean what is is there anything about your day-to-day -day that you really enjoy doing aside from you know maybe working with the rookies and the vets and anything stand out to you yeah, I mean, it changes so much. Like, I obviously, the overall arching thing of, like, being – I get paid to watch basketball. So, I would I would say, like, you know, and, and the number one thing, probably it's the most underrated, but the fact that I wear sweats to work. Like, I I, I think that's – That is clutch, that, yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> the best. So, wearing sweats to work. Obviously, we'll throw on suits for the games and, and stuff. But, I like and, – and just understanding, like – the, the people that I'm around too, like um, just the, the type of people. So like those relationships, like for instance, you guys got Mike Brown coming to Sacramento. He's he's someone that, you know, I've gotten really close with and, and have a deep respect for. So being able to just build these relationships that I know will last forever. Um, but in terms of like just official duties, 
um, I would say just having these conversations that as a kid, you know, you you have on 2K or something or like, oh man, as a fan, you're like, oh, I would do this and this. And then now being able to step back and like, I look at the Gary Payton, um, you know, Gary Payton kind of trajectory, like being involved in those conversations in terms of saying like, oh, you know, Gary's done this in the G League, we should take a chance on him. And then kind of seeing that, you know, go through or the same thing with like being in the draft room and pushing for a certain guy and then, you know, seeing that guy's development start to take off. So I would just say the overall process of it has been really dope to see. Yeah, it is, must be. Oh, go ahead, Sam. I was just going to say, is there something of, uh, that you geek out about at work, uh, working with players? Like there's a lot of data, I imagine, with what you do. Is there something in particular that you're just like, oh, I'd love your PR? Like what is, the, you know, uh, what, what is something that, that you nerd out about that's, that's fun to you? Man, I'm big on efficiency, so I like. I I think every number is different depending on who it's related to. So, uh, like I like Jordan Poole. When Jordan Poole has high defensive numbers, you know, that's the one I always kind of <laughs> always point out to him. Or like, you know, for Kaminga was transition points this year. Like I try to find certain things. Uh, you know, with Loon, it's like screen assists. So, so every guy is different, but I always try to find those little things that. Don't show up in a traditional box score, but that helped us win. Um, so, like, and obviously, I think everyone in, in the organization this year with, with Wiggins and his rebounding, that was the big uh, rebounding and dunks because we always tell him to dunk and he always tries to lay it up. And so, when he started posterizing everybody in the playoffs, I think we were all excited. Oh, yeah. We, I mean, we were too. <laughs> I think his, his offensive rebounding was like the story of the finals. Yeah, he was big, man. He was so big, especially defensively. Yeah, that was incredible. What did you all do to Kevon Looney's hips? He played 500 games this season. What did you guys do? <laughs> Man, that was a performance staff. He he came in and at the beginning of the year and told them that he wants to play every game. And, and they were on him. And I think what helped them too is he started doing yoga this year and started eating super clean. And so I think stuff like that, man, He that's all him. It's all him. Like our performance staff was huge, but it was all him. He locked in on the goal and, you know, it's hard to play 104 games in a year, but he, he did and he did at a high level too so I would say man that's all him and our performance there so you grew up playing uh, in AAU and you're kind of used to a lot of these bigger names that you know Fadid and I would uh would go grow red-faced if we ran into them is there anyone that you met uh, or would meet now uh that would make you kind of be starstruck you're probably used to it at this point but was, has there been someone or is there someone that would make you go oh my god that's so and so I don't think in the basketball world, just because like a lot, like, like I like, a, like I've, I've either met them or I interact or work with them. And like, but I, in, in general, if you're saying I, it would be Obama, I think that's the one guy in the world where I'd be like, man, just because of his social impact, um, I would say he's the one that I'd be like, man, but from like a basketball standpoint, I don't think so. There's been guys where I've been like, man, you know what, respect everything. Like Sean Livingston was one of those guys. When I first went on, I was like, man, like just what he stands for. And I, I think that's been a big reason why I don't think there's anyone in the basketball world because working hand in hand with Sean and, and talking to him every day is kind of like, man, he's one of the guys I respect the most in, in the basketball world. Um, and like Grant Hill was another one. Grant Hill went to my high school actually. Um, and he's from he's from Reston, Virginia, out in Nova. And so he uh, I met him during the playoffs. Sean actually introduced me to him. And, we chop it up all the time now just because it's such a small world. And uh, so, yeah, but I, I don't think there's anyone in the basketball world. Uh, soccer, I'm a huge Kylian Mbappe fan. So I think if I met him, I'd be like, yo, you know, respect. Who's your squad? <laughs> Unfortunately, Manchester United, man. We haven't been too hot, baby. <laughs> you had the glory days growing up. It's good enough. Right? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, you know, I keep that on the DL. <laughs> Yeah, we're we're a couple of big soccer heads here too. So, who do you guys like? I'm a Chelsea guy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> as long as it's not City, Barcelona. Oh, I, yeah. I get, I'm more of a Madrid guy, but you know, I I like I respect both of those teams. Okay. Yeah. So we're vibing. It's all good. No, no big <laughs> rivalries here. Uh, so I I did want to ask a little bit about you know your experience working with with the G League and how you guys you know leverage that your your G League team and G League players. I mean. I think the Warriors had, was it five players on the championship roster that had spent some significant time in the G League? Yeah, oh. significant. It was five guys. Yeah. 
Yeah. So like, what, what's that process like, of, you know, if somebody like Jordan Poole sent, you know, he's a first round draft pick, obviously not a lottery pick, but you know, how do you deal with that transition of telling him, Hey, you got to go to the G league for a bit and come back. And, you know, maybe there's some of that yo-yo effect, but yeah. What, what's that, that process like in working with that team and then, you know, transitioning the guys back and forth. For sure. I would say, so this was my first full year really being deeply acclimated in the G league, you know, so much fun. Um, I think the first thing I had to learn was, when you're watching a player, whether it be in college or, or wherever, and you're evaluating him, you also have to evaluate him in the lens of, like, not only, like, one, how does he perform in the current league that he's in, whether it's college, overseas, or whatever. Second, can he be an NBA player? Thirdly, how would he do in the G League? Like, every level is different. So that was the first thing I had to learn, like, watching a guy, like, okay, maybe he's not an NBA player, but he could help, he could play in the G League um, and understand the, diff- the style of game in the G League. That was number one. Um, but then also, it's just a humbling experience. Like when I go to G League games, you know, it's it's not it's not as packed as NBA games. So I would say that's big. But then, um, yeah, we have like the, the, with with Golden State. The one thing I will say is just just the the symmetry between Santa Cruz and Golden State is is amazing. But there's you know players like a bunch of coaches in front of office started in Santa Cruz and now they're with Golden State, and so. I just think there's there's a good amount of symmetry, but it was so much fun. Like there's so much talent in the G League. I consider it the second best league in the world after uh, Europe or after the NBA. Um, Hard to argue with that, yeah. Yeah, and and I, I think it's not just us; it's just the NBA in general now. Guys, you know, with the evolving of the two way contract, you know, teams are, are are instead of you know just benching their guys and then scrimmaging in practice, they're now sending them on assignment, and so. Man, I think I think the G League is moving in the right direction. Um, I think the NBA has done a good job with that. And I think teams helped a lot by buying into it. Yeah, and you get some of these high school kids that are like a Kaminga, for example. You know, chose to play in the G League for a year versus doing doing college. So uh, yeah, it's I'm pro players league. getting paid. So I I like when 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 they started doing stuff like that. Oh yeah, for sure. Whether it's NIL or G League or sure. going to play in New Zealand, whatever it is, we're all all sure. about you know maximizing your your earning potential while you, while you can. Absolutely, uh, not for sure. Yeah. So with with summer league coming up, I think you guys have a couple games coming up this weekend for the California Classic. I mean, how do you yeah. ramp up to that, and what do you look for? You know, for some of these tryout players, maybe not just the rookies because they're already on the team, but maybe some of the guys that are looking to earn a contract. You know, what are you looking for? In, in those games yeah I mean again I would it, you come in kind of with somewhat high expectations but not crazy high expectations um so you, first off you look for like does this guy have the IQ or feel to play in the NBA or G League um secondly what's their definable skill like we always talk about every player if you want a Steph Curry or, or all-around player you have to have at least one skill that'll keep you on the NBA or G League court so those are the things we really look for in the summer league. And then, you know, based on our roster, how can they, you know, enhance our team? So those are the different things you're looking for. Um, and it's fun because all the teams are there, you know, a, a lot of people get hired at the G League because all the coaches are there, front office is there, and it's just a big networking hub. Uh, so, uh, man, summer league is always fun. That's that's kind of where we were able to to really kind of engrave Juan just kind of innocent on the team. And so, you know, you basically go to summer league every year trying to find another Gary Payne or Juan Descon or Anderson. Summer league is fun. It's you, it's but it's from a customer standpoint too. You pay like twenty thirty dollars and you can watch two games cheap. in one day. It's great. Yeah, it's just hot. It's so hot out there and it's long. We're out there for like ten days and it's like man, I right. basketball from eight a.m. to like ten p.m. You're like, I right, this this is a little tiring. Is, how much of it is networking when there's so many people coming to watch all this talent? A lot, man, because it, it's 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 just like a, some of the best networking I do is like with some of my closest friends from other teams is we don't even talk basketball, we just talk about life. Like we'll go out to dinners or like you know you'll be at the game and they'll come sit and watch the game with you. And so like a lot of it is like you know we'll do dinners like after the game. You know we set up like pickup games early in the morning, like seven a.m. So like it's just natural networking through stuff like that. But I just a lot of it, yeah. I've come across people that really want to work in sports and they had kind of a similar uh, assumption as you did that you had to be, uh, you know, related to somebody that played or uh, sell tickets for six years and get a promotion. But you, 
uh, you, you, went to, you went back to school for sports management. Is that something you recommend? And what other advice would you have for someone that does want to work in sports? Uh, I wouldn't recommend it uh, because I, I, <laughs> I appreciate I, the honesty. Yeah, I think I, like, it helped me for sure. But I, I think that's because I didn't study sports management undergraduate. And you don't you honestly don't even need to um, if like there's different fields in sports. You can do public relations, communications, business like, you know, um, but I would say the reason I said I don't recommend this because I just think the cost of education in this country is, is so inflated nowadays. Um, but what I would say would help is first of all, identify what you want to do. You get you have a head start there earlier. You can identify what specific you want to do. Um, and then just be present. So um, little things like try to get an internship if possible. Um, and then try to show up to things like a summer league or, you know, or like a, uh, you know, playoffs or something just to be around because end of the day, people hire people that they, they trust can get the job done, but more importantly, that they want to spend eight to 10 hours a day with. And so uh, I, my LinkedIn DMs is flooded with people asking for jobs. I'm like, one, I don't have a job to offer you. Secondly, it's like, if I did have a job to offer you, I don't know you. I know 20 other people that are qualified and I know that they're good people. So I, like naturally, it's human instinct, any and not just sports, any industry, you're going to hire people that, you know, you have a standing relationship with. For sure. It's uh, your, what is it? Uh, your net worth is determined by your network. So for sure. Like <laughs> your sure. network determines your net worth, however that saying goes. And it sounds like that that's how it worked out for you and with the connections that you made and some of the, the hookups that you got, uh, you know, once you earned your place, seemed like you were it would move up pretty quickly as well. So uh, still trying to, man, still trying to. <laughs> so, so what's, what's the goal? Are you, are you trying to be, you know, one day be the first, you know, Sudanese GM in the NBA? Like, what, what do you want to do with your career? Yeah, I would say, I would say that for sure. But like, whenever I get asked that question, it's like, man, I, now that this is my first championship, it used to always be like, I just want to win. Like, to me, it's like, I love the people I work with. So like, for me, like if, you know, I don't know, the OKC off for me to jam position. I'm like, ah, do I really want to leave California and go to Oklahoma City? You know, do I really want to leave the Warriors? And so, like, I would always be like, man, I, I like where I'm at. I, I love the organization I work for. You know, I love the city I live in. And we're winning. So, for me, it's like, man, that people always just think, like, title. So, it's like, I want to be GM. To me, man, I just want to keep winning. And I, I want to keep having an impact, too. Like, and I feel like I've been put in a position with this team where I'm able to do that. Like, I'm, you know, I have say in certain, you know, things and, and you know, I've been able to build good relationships with the guys. And so I would say, man, just to keep building on this. And then, you know, if I can find a situation where, you know, I can end up getting to that level and doing that at a winning level, for sure. Yeah, I, I really, I appreciate that answer. I appreciate the honesty because I mean, it's like you said, it's, it's not always about what, what's the next thing. It's about, you know, enjoying where you're at. It sounds like that's why Kenny Atkinson <laughs> decided to stay with the Warriors, okay. right? He's happy where he's <laughs> at. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good old Kenny, man. A championship will do that to you. <laughs> yeah, right? He probably, like, saw the parade and was like, ah, you know, I kind of like it here, San Francisco, you know. <laughs> made, made MJ hire a guy that used to work for him already. <laughs> Yeah, him and his family love it out here. So I'm, I'm, we're all glad that he decided to to come back and, and running back. He was so big in terms of develop, developing our young guys too. That's what's yeah, so cool about the Warriors. It's like two, three head coaches on the bench next to Steve Kerr. It's incredible. We tried to man. It's it's yeah. He's done a great job building out that staff. And I think that that says a lot about the team's culture and Steve Kerr being so secure in his role and not. You know, and he wants the best people around him. Uh, it seems like that's kind of the top to bottom uh, culture for the organization. They're all about diversity and hiring the best people. And, you know, so it's uh, it's really great to see you, you know, in this role and some of the other folks you mentioned, David Kelly and Dave Fatoki. It's, it's, it's awesome, man. For sure. Yeah, yeah man. It's a, I, I'd say that's the best part of being here is just the people I work with. Um, it doesn't really feel like work, um, especially when you win. And so, yeah, I think that that's always the biggest thing that I reflect on is is being able to do like special things with special people. It's such a unique uh, set of people too. like Steve Kerr, such an interesting guy. 
Andre Godala is a really smart guy and he says a lot of things tongue in cheek, but I think it's because he comes from, uh, he just, he has a lot of experience. Uh, is he that sarcastic in person? Yes. He is <laughs> a big ass kid. Yes. Anyway. He's such a kid in everything that he does. <laughs> and I have a question about Draymond because he's been in the news a lot. Yeah. You know, is, is he that intense and passionate every single day or is it just yeah. the switch he flips? Uh, yes and no kind of in the middle man he's okay. definitely genuine with his intensity and passion which i think is why he's so well respected by everyone um uh, but he doesn't just walk around cursing people out like if he trusts you and like you haven't done anything to to rub him the wrong way he's, he's a great guy great human being great father so yeah what you see on the podcast isn't 24 7 <laughs> it seems like yeah that's that's the theme is is great people yeah. and you know when you love what you do it's not really work right so at all at all man I, that's definitely definitely how how i feel at least uh any last questions this time i want to be respectful of your time so yeah i hope i'm not overstepping do you have a favorite story from uh the warriors draymond steph that you're okay with sharing um trying to see in terms of favorite story because i don't really reflect too much on the stories and to maybe think. what we'll ask maybe from a basketball perspective is there a game or a, a stretch during the regular season this year where you thought you know we can win a championship we have a championship caliber team yeah it's funny because at the beginning of the year they they like our our vp of analytics like asked us to do this anonymous survey about like you know how many games you think we'll win and i think the max was like you know, between 40 or, or, you know, 48 to like 52. And, and me and David were talking about like, can we choose higher? Like we, we were like, we're gonna, we thought we both could be good. Like, we were like, yeah, we were you're spot on, right? Yeah, and so I think that, you know, I, obviously that was just kind of like, we're gonna be good. And then I think in terms of winning the championship, I think um, obviously we had the hot start, but I, just the way we were able to do it, I think, I think that's when it kind of hit me like, okay, we have some resiliency. Um, and then, so I would say that for sure. In terms of like a memorable game, like, man, I would say the Utah game from this year was really good when Steph was hurt and we were down by a lot and we, we came back and won. There's like later at the end of the year. Yeah, was yeah. Early, I was actually in Europe. I was on a scouting trip in Europe. And I was like, it was like 3 a.m. And I was so upset that I stayed up to watch it. <laughs> and then we just started going off. And I was like, man. And it was so big for Jordan's confidence, too. And so that was a big one for sure. Yeah, that was kind of his coming out party until, of course, the, the Denver series where he became yeah. like he a, started something else that series. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool, man. We I really, really appreciate you taking the time out. I know this, uh, you're a busy guy. You got summer league coming up and, and the free agency and all that. So uh, thank you again. Uh, hopefully we could do this uh, again sometime. For sure, man. I, I appreciate you guys having me on, man. And uh, let's go Dubs. Let's run it back. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Back We're going to repeat, baby. Back to back. <laughs> All right, fellas. All right, man. See you Take guys. it easy, my friend. Thank you, brother. Once again, a big shout out. Big thank you to Mustaba for taking some time out of his busy schedule to, uh, to chat with us about the Dubs and letting us nerd out a bit as, as two big Warriors fans. Uh, so thank you all for listening. Really appreciate you guys ch checking us out. Make sure to uh, to follow, like, and subscribe uh, at SLS Inc. at 4040 Vision Pod on Twitter. And make sure to check us out on all your podcasting platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. Until next time, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Fat house on the hill. All the homies in the pen straight locked down. But I got to get dressed and hit the hotel. I call Randy Austin on the telephone. Early in the morning, but he still ain't home.